talk. Glad you're back. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we, we pray for the nation of Afghanistan. Lord, we know that Christian workers are being killed. Afghanis who have confessed Christ in the last 20 years are being killed. And Lord, we know that just human beings created in your image are being destroyed. And Lord, we just pray that your spirit would please limit evil there. We pray, Lord, that you would please be with the soldiers who have served in Afghanistan. And Lord, that you will strengthen and comfort them as they see those who they fought with and worked with attempting to flee the country. Lord, we pray that you would please bring revival there. Lord, we particularly ask that you would give wisdom to our President Biden as he tries to think through how it is that he should respond to the humanitarian crisis. And God, we pray that you would save the Christians, oh, but Lord, that you would also limit evil. Lord Jesus, it is powerful enough and gross enough that we would even ask that you would return and that you would end such wickedness. God, we pray for our president that if he does not know you, that he would come to know you now. And Lord, we ask that on the last day that he would be able to give an account to your law by being clad in the alien righteousness of Christ. Lord, we pray for our missionary Brandon Jones. We ask, Lord, that you would please be with him and comfort and strengthen him as he is seen co-workers die of COVID in Brazil, and Lord, that he and his family would be able to rest, and Lord, that you would strengthen them as they will now begin to visit their many different churches that support them. Lord, we pray for Mercy Hill Church. We ask, Lord, that you'd please be with the pastors there, and that they would preach the gospel boldly and well, and that many would be saved. And finally, Lord, we ask that you would help us as a church to respond rightly to the events of this world in a way that honors and glorifies your Son. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So allow me to read to you some of the uses of the word natural in headlines. This Kim Kardashian and Meghan Markle approved stretch mark oil just got an all-natural makeover. I'm not actually sure what the word natural means here, but I think it means safe with minimal manufacturing and processing, a little bit like natural food. Haiti's new prime minister faces challenges brought on by natural disaster. So natural here means things that happen outside of human control. Alligator found swimming in Massachusetts hundreds of miles from natural habitat. And natural here means where something is supposed to be. Condemned California killer dies of natural causes at 74. And natural here means without human causes. And then Jennifer Hudson is a natural to play Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin. And I think here the word natural means simply fit. So clearly the word natural is sort of a big and expansive word, much like love and freedom and, and democracy. It has lots of meaning. And I want us to keep this in mind as we are approaching our topic, which is rebelling against nature. Part of the argument that I have been making for the last three sermons is that starting in about the 1600s, Western culture began to publicly hate God. It became sort of the official activity of academics and of many nations, and they began to hate God. And then as the public acceptance of hating God became common, we be then began to use reasoning to turn against the Bible and then as a culture, we have turned against reason. And then the final act of our cultural rebellion against God is to rebel and turn against nature. And so if you have your Bibles with you this morning, please open them to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts 
with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. Today's sermon is not fundamentally about homosexuality or transgenderism. Both of these sins are actually symptoms of a much wider problem. And I strongly agree with the medieval theologian Thomas when he writes, every sin is said to be against nature. There's, there's a sense in which every time we sin, we are turning against nature. And we are rebelling against the way that God has created us. And when God created us, he gave us three foundations of stability. The first foundation of stability that God gave us was a personal relationship with him. And, and these stabilities or these, these pillars that God gave us, like a relationship with him, were designed to help us move around in the world and to explore the beautiful universe that God had given us safely. The primary one was this relationship with God. So we were created to be God's friends and to walk with Him each day and to enjoy Him and the world that He gave us. And God is so suspendously wonderful that loving Him is what we were to do naturally. And to not love Him or to be indifferent to Him or to disobey Him was simply to hate Him. So God's first pillar or, or foundation of stability that he gave to humanity was a personal relationship with himself. But the second foundation is that God created us in his image. And last week we talked about a component of that, which is reason. So the being created in the image of God includes the ability to make judgments and to set moral standards. The Apostle Paul describes it this way in Romans chapter 2, verse 15. Just flip over a page to Romans chapter 2, verse 15, or, or slide, or however it is that you move through God's Word. Romans 2, 15, the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So what the image of God does is that it allows us to speak to ourselves and to ask questions about right and wrong and to make judgments. In in shorthand, we call this reason. It's the ability to look within our hearts and unite and divide things that ought to be divided and united. The third foundation that God gave us besides reason is that he gave us the physical world with its spiritual and physical structures. The world tells us about itself, and our bodies respond to the world. And so we avoid things like swimming in freezing water at the same time that we avoid the heat of a fire. And and we do so without thought. It's a part of our our nature. Even a, a little child pulls his hand away from a fire. Now, the odd thing is, is that we love to drink cold water on a hot day and hot cocoa on a cold day. So we don't completely and totally avoid these things. We just try to do them in in due proportion. And this is what nature teaches us. So when God created the world, it was natural for human beings to be friends with God. It was simply the way things ought to be and the way that things are. It was natural for all human beings to use reason to do things and to understand the order of life from the world around them. There was when God created us, it was, it was normal to be friends with God. It was, it was normal to use reason rightly, and it was normal for creation to tell us about the world. So, so listen to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. God is Adam's friend, and God wants Adam to discover that he needs a human helper, a human friend. In, in the same way that we want our children to learn how to read, and, and then they, we want the, to, them to go to school and to start a family. So God wanted Adam to realize that he was incomplete without a friend. And then we read this in Genesis 2.20. Then man gave names to all of the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. And, and so what we're being told in this passage is that Adam knows the difference between himself and apes and platypuses and snails. 
And while he could enjoy and govern all of these things, there was not a helper fit for him. So Adam was able to use his reason to understand the purpose of the different animals, how they all worked together, and how they were interdependent, but he also understood that he did not have a helper or a friend. And so God created Eve to be Adam's human friend so that they could cooperate together in obedience to God. So it was natural in the beginning for man to be a friend of God, for reason to guide and support us, and we love God and each other, and we organized, explored, and cared for God's gift of creation. And then sin entered the picture. Adam and Eve did something unnatural and unreasonable, and they hated God, and humanity then changed human nature in the sense that we were designed to have the love of God in our hearts. And when Adam and Eve sinned, the love of God left our hearts. And so now our friendship with God was broken, and our reason was impaired. And what the Lord did is He put forward a plan of salvation, whereby He would send the Son of God to reestablish friendship with God through faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, God also changed the spiritual and physical nature of human beings and the universe. This is from Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 to 18. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. You see, God, in response to sin, changed human nature, and he changed the physical nature. And he did this because Adam broke his friendship with God, and now his reason is impaired, death is embedded with creation, and nature is in tension with humanity. So humanity and nature are both codependent and at war. So right now, you have bacteria in your body, and if you did not have that bacteria, you would die. And at the same time, there's a whole bunch of bacteria that if you did have in your body, you would be dying. So so humanity is both codependent on nature and at the same time in tension and at war with it. So if your immune system is not working, you get sick. And do you know what happens if your immune system is overactive? You get sick. There's something wrong with our physical stuff. Death is embedded in our bodies. Now, nature doesn't speak as clearly to us, and our reason is prone to sinful error. So much so that without the Bible and the Spirit guiding us, Ecclesiastes 3, 19 to 21 would be the last word. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to the dust all returns. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So what Solomon is teaching us is that under the sun, from the perspective of just seeing things, touching things, looking at the world around you, we're just really bright animals and then we die. That's all that your senses will tell you. And and by the way, it's not Charles Darwin who just made that statement, it's Solomon. When when Solomon does the thought experiment of if, if there is no God, what do we got? And the answer is nothing. We're all going to die. Yet that's not all that the Bible says that nature tells us. Nature does speak clearly on one issue, and this is from Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. So what does nature tell us fundamentally? Well, that is, is that God's mad at us. We all know that someone is mad at us or angry with us because of ungodliness and 
unrighteousness. But what ends up happening is that every person and every culture comes up with their own enemy who's not God. And so their enemy is like the anarchists and the Huns and the middle class and the liberals and the Houthis and the communists or whatever. Or humanity is going to be in a moral panic about overpopulation, underpopulation, global cooling or global warming or nuclear war and so forth. It just keeps moving on. I remember even as a child doing duck and cover drills in Marengo, Iowa in like 1979, thinking to myself, I'm not sure that this is going to work. Those look like really big bombs. <laughs> it's going to help if I'm under my desk. <laughs> We're always worried about something. When I was a kid, the big worry was nuclear winter. It's going to get cold. We're all going to freeze to death. It's going to get hot. We're all going to burn up. Communists and, and infidels and Huns and all kinds of things. All of these things, true and untrue, are a subconscious response to the fact, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. We know something's wrong. Now, the last thing is that nature teaches us is a fitness, both moral and physical. So James describes it this way for us in James chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. For the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olives or grape vines produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Nature tells us the fitness of, of things. Now, having considered all of these things, we can begin to speak about rebelling against nature. Rebelling against nature is when humanity refuses to hear what nature tells us. Nature speaks of God. Nature includes within the human heart a conscience, which includes the works of the moral law. Nature as a structure tells us what the purpose of things and the fitness of their use. This is what nature does for us. And what should be really clear, if you know the Ten Commandments at all, is that there's something wrong with the human heart. We have an unnatural human heart. We have a heart that doesn't fit into this world. The problem of the human heart is that we love the wrong stuff in the wrong way. Listen, listen to how Jesus describes it. This is in Mark chapter 7, verses 18 to 22. And Jesus said to the apostles, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, and sexual immorality, and theft, and murder, and adultery, and coveting, and wickedness, and deceit, and sensuality, and envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. You see, the world's response to this, this oppressive sense that God is mad at us is, is we're going to have less of a carbon footprint. We're just going to get rid of all of the middle class, and then a utopia will be swept in. We're, we'll get rid of all illegal drugs, and then there won't be any problems. And what Jesus tells us is that our hearts are messed up. We love the wrong stuff when it brings us temporary pleasure and even lifelong pleasure, and then it begins to feel normal. Even so, we know within the recesses of our conscience that evil thought, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness is wrong. Folks, part of the reason that I wanted to illustrate for us the many uses of the word natural is because I want you to know at the end of the day, almost anything will begin to feel normal anything. You, you, you can practice a sin so much that it begins to feel completely normal. One of the frustrations that I have in sort of the church's response to sexual sin when I was a kid is that we made fun of homosexuals, but we promoted heterosexual sin. And so what would look like really godly Christian men would encourage young boys to look at scantily clad girls at the swimming pool because that was going to keep them from the sin of homosexuality. It, it's a horrible idea. But you see, 
heterosexual sin was more normal in the church, and so we pressed on that. Sin feels normal. We see an example of this in the East German secret police, the Stasi. The, the Stasi is probably the most repressive police force in world history. At the height of the Stasi's power, between agents and informants, there was one, one assigned person to every 6.5 East Germans. These guys controlled everything, and at the height of their powers, they created a psychological tactic called decomposition to drive their citizens frantic. They would break into your house, and they would replace the picture of your mother uh, with someone else. They, they would go through your sock drawer and reorganize it. They, they would um, put vodka in the milk bottle. They, they would do all kinds of things just to drive you completely crazy. And they were all doing it with what they felt was legal. And if you had asked them in, let's say, 1984 whether or not they were doing the right thing, they said, yes, everything that we're doing is legal and wonderful. And then the Berlin Wall fell, and the Stasis burned one billion pages of documents within three days because they knew judgment was coming. They knew they'd been sinning. They knew that they had been being wicked. At the same time, while they had security, they rejoiced in gross and perverse wickedness. Now, the terrifying thing about sin is that when we do it, we do so while recognizing within our hearts that it's a sin. If you ever get a chance, a woman by the name of Hannah Arnett wrote a book called The Banality of Evil. It's about the guy who made the trains run on time for the Holocaust. And he was a true believer in Nazism and killing Jews. And at the end of the war, he was the only prominent Nazi who was still trying to kill Jews and wasn't trying to hide the fact because he really didn't think he'd done anything wrong. All the other Nazis are trying to hide stuff. Not him, because you see, sin had become so normal to him that he didn't even believe in, in human judgment. So when we sin, we rebel against nature. We rebel against what creation tells us about God. We rebel against reason, and we rebel against the physical creation, yet all sin feels normal and right without God's grace. I want you to imagine a teenager who covets an iPhone 12 Pro. He feels frustrated and hurt and harmed because he doesn't have the phone. He, he sees the advantages in status and mental serenity and pleasure that would flow to him if his parents would just give him a thousand dollars to buy that new phone. Now, the advantages are real, but 50 years ago, there were no cell phones. The object of desire is not natural on multiple grounds, but the desires and the affections are real and feel normal. It feels completely and totally normal for a 19-year-old kid to demand that his parents spend $1,000 to buy him a device which will be gone in three years. So the desire, the thing that he wants is real. What he feels in his heart is real. It feels normal to what all of his friends want. But it's essentially unnatural. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying that cell phones are something that would be a sin for you to use. <laughs> I have one. It didn't cost $1,000, so. Um, but it's similar to all sins. When we restract out using reason, the Bible, and nature, the buffoonery and foolishness of sin becomes clear. Think about murder for a second. In the United States right now, 61% of all murders are actually cleared. And the person who does it is charged. But why would someone try to murder someone else? Mostly be so they can, because they believe they can get away with it. But what the Bible says is that then comes the judgment, when all actions and all words will be weighed by an ever-present, all-knowing, all-powerful God, all sin is known. Do you remember the psalm where David says that his iniquities are more than the hairs of his head? 
Do you know what he's saying? I have sinned so much, I don't even remember all of it. All sins are known. Now, sometimes non-Christians will defend sin through the observation of the animal kingdom. And so I've heard both popular and academic defenses of homosexuality and transgenderism by animal behavior. So you can read headlines from this. This is from CNN. A gay penguin couple adopted an egg in a Berlin zoo. And I watched a television show called CIS where they're in defense of gender transition and transgenderism, the, the argument was that because there are some soft shell mollusks that have both male and female productive organs and that certain conditions can, fun- can cause them to express one more than the other, this means that human beings also should be transgendered. Now, the only way that you can possibly come to that conclusion is by false analogy. The, the penguins aren't gay. There's not a lot of evidence that penguins can even tell the difference between boy and girl penguins. They are stressed animals living in confinement. Prior to human beings giving them an egg to sit on, they sat on rocks and dead fish because they can't even tell the difference between an egg and a rock. And by the way, on the mollusk, it turns out most mollusks don't even have brains. And so none of this actually works. Our friend C.S. Lewis reminds us But nature gives most of her evidence in answer to questions we ask her. The questions determine how much of the total truth will appear and what pattern it will suggest. And so if you go to nature and say, do I have an excuse for sin? Nature will say yes, because you're the one making the judgment from the information. Do do you see how it works? If you ask nature, is there evidence that I should murder their na- my neighbor? The answer will be yes, because you're the one selecting the data set. It's confirmation bias. Now, in our current area, the church is responding to our culture's rebellion against nature when it comes to homosexuality, abortion, and transgenderism. The- these things are unnatural. It is unnatural for a mom to go and have her child killed. It is unnatural for someone to create a wound in their body as a replacement for healthy male parts and then to spend the rest of their life on hormones to maintain it and to continue in the rest of their life to have surgery so that they can get rid of the parts that nature gave them. It's unnatural. But I want you to look down with me for a moment to Romans chapter 1, verses 29 to 31. They are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice. They are all full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, they are slanders, they are haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. So if we as a church are going to condemn rebellion against nature, which we should, we must also include all manner of unrighteousness in our condemnation. Like that fellow whose name was Solomon. Do you remember Solomon? He was the guy who was really, really natural. So he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That is also a rebellion against nature. And let's not forget how often our Christian heirs have celebrated envy and heartlessness and ruthlessness. When Senator Strom Thurmond died, Strom Thurmond was famous for being a Baptist, a racist, and a noted heterosexual. Racism and promiscuous heterosexual sin is also rebelling against nature. So the first step of having a natural heart is not recognizing the physical and psychological destruction caused by sin. I think many times when Christians approach how how do we handle these gross rebellions against nature, what we do is that we list out all the bad physical things that will happen if you do X. And for some small part of the population, that does help them. 
but I want you to know that the world is aware that being sex positive destroys the body. And they spend billions of dollars reducing the impact of sin. When the movie Fifty Shades of Grey came out, they sent memos to all of the emergency rooms in the United States to help them treat people who are harming themselves, modeling the behavior they were seeing in the movie. Everybody knows. Everybody. And the world is willing to spend billions of dollars to overcome the detriments of sinning against nature. The non-Christian writer J.K. Rowling has had her books burnt for protesting this madness. The, the woman's not even a Christian, but she's more reasonable than others. So the first step is not recognizing the physical and psychological destruction caused by sin. The world already knows. The first step is to recognize that you've sinned against God. We live in an age of rampant individualism without trust in God, so much so that in 2019, an Indian man attempted to bring a lawsuit against his parents for conceiving him without his permission. Now, he was also attempting to highlight his stance, which is human beings should stop reproducing. But nature and the Bible teaches us that we are born in interdependent relationships. We are born dependent on God, dependent on our parents, who in turn are dependent on a wider society and the physical world. Nature teaches that we must recognize our creaturely interdependence and our absolute need for God. And having a natural heart is not continuing in sinful sex practices by making sex safe. Rather, it starts by recognizing that you're a sinner and that you need God's mercy and that God has provided us abundant help by giving us grace. By grace, God has given us the Bible. By grace, God has given us the Son to die on the cross to pay for the penalty for our sins. And by grace, God has sent the Holy Spirit to save us and, and help us. And so the way that we begin to have a natural heart is by asking God to save us from our sins. And, and again, please, I can list out for you for hours how bad an idea it is to use illegal drugs or to do promiscuous sex of heterosexual or homosexual or pansexual or whatever you have. I, I can spend all the time doing that, and it doesn't matter because you can just spend more money to do it safely. What really matters is that you come to God and recognize that you have sinned. Have you told God that you have an unnatural heart with wicked passions, and have you received the Son to, to save you? Part of the reason that I had us read that passage of sins as our prayer of confession is because those are the sins that we don't like, right, as Christians. And what does Paul say? And so were some of you. And then you came to know Jesus. Have you come to know Jesus? Now, if you have, it's then that we come to this issue of enjoying the nature of heaven. I, I want you to listen to the first part of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the daily prayer of the Christian is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And how is God's will done in heaven with alacrity? So the most natural thing in heaven is immediate, eager, joyful obedience to the revealed word of God. I, I almost imagine all these angels surrounded by, by around the throne of God and they're leaning forward saying, do I get to go do something? And then they take off the moment God says, you do that. And, and, and they run in excitement and in, in joy. And this is why our Lord Jesus came down to earth from heaven, and that was to show us how to live a natural life. This is why Jesus tells us this, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. 
So, so what is it that Christians are supposed to be doing to live this natural life that God has given us? And the answer is, is that we're supposed to be doing the Father's will in heaven. To enjoy the nature of heaven, we must be the people who live by grace and attempt to do the will of God. And living by grace means recognizing that Jesus Christ has already done the will of the Father on earth by his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, and his soon return. What Jesus does is the Father's will. And then Jesus tells us this, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I'll raise Him up on the last day. So if you're here right now, and you're wondering, how is it that you can have a natural heart, a heart that conforms to the nature of heaven, and the answer is, receive Jesus. This is how we become natural. It's not by going to a natural health food store. Really. That might be more natural, but that's not what God's talking about. So the normal and natural that God the Father wants from us is that everyone who looks at the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I'll raise Him up on the last day. What God the Father wants is a restored relationship with humanity, and for us to adopt the reason of God, and to adopt the will of God, to allow Jesus to restore our nature so that if we die, we will be resurrected and live with God forever. You know, there's a horrible, horrible way in which hell is unnatural. Hell is isolation. Hell is darkness. Hell is pain. Hell is a lack of joy. Hell is a place with no hope and no faith. It's an unnatural place. The invitation of the gospel is to be natural. And if we confess our sins and trust in Jesus Christ, our new natural will become experiencing eternal life. Listen to this. This is Revelation 22, 1 through 4. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on the other side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. <coughs> the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, which includes the pastor with a bad cold. I want you to know I do not have COVID. I've been tested a lot. I'm vaccinated. I've had it. It's just a cold. No longer will there be anything accursed. There will be no more COVID-19 in heaven by God's grace alone. But the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Sin will be no more, and we will not only have friendship with God, but we will be in his presence with joy and delight. And we'll be in heaven, not because we are the good people, but because it was the Father's will that Jesus and his Spirit would save everyone who believes. What, what's the joy of heaven? What, what's the natural of heaven? The natural of heaven is that every person look to Jesus Christ and be saved. Yet you may have noticed we're not in heaven. How do we live according to the heavenly nature now? Well, we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, where Paul wrote, so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So we enjoy the nature of heaven by joining a local church. And part of the church's purpose is to prepare us to live in heaven. Folks, we are not here just to sing. We're here to practice for heaven, which includes singing. And so what we're supposed to do is to come into the church and to begin to experience and learn what our permanent place will be like in heaven. So as a church, what we're supposed to be doing is learning the new normal of God's published will. We're learning what's natural in heaven. And we do this according to Colossians 3, 5, by putting to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And, and what the earthly stuff is, is all the unnatural passions that seem so normal to us. You remember I opened up by talking about an alligator that was in Massachusetts. I think if you asked the alligator, does this feel normal, he'd probably be like, sure. Here I am. What do you mean I'm out of my natural habitat? I'm not in an apartment building. What do you want? That's what sin is like. And we have to put those things to death. 
We have to get a taste for the water of life bright as crystal. We, we want to be the people whose desire is for the water of heaven. And whenever we have a really good drink, whenever we have a really good enjoyment, we think that's going to heaven. That's going to be in, in heaven. Now, how do we get a taste for the water of life bright as crystal? Well, we do it by trusting in God. And we mortify sin. And, and mortifying sin is not supposed to be an unhappy effort, though it, it takes effort. It, it's supposed to be like that sense of satisfaction when you've just sprayed down the north side of your house and all of the mold and algae is gone and it's clean, and you're like, yes, so good, clean, I can still smell the bleach. Or when you look out at your lawn and there are no dandelions. <laughs> That's what mortification is supposed to be like. Is it hard? Yes, it is. Does it take effort? Yes, it does. But the satisfaction that comes afterwards makes it a happy thing. You have cooperated with Christ when there's no more dandelions in your soul or crabgrass or whatever, whatever weed that you hate. That's what it means to mortify your sin. Now, the Lord God works with us graciously in the process, and sometimes for people who have never known the gospel, the Spirit of God will sweep through the garden of their soul, removing much of the gross sin. But for those of us who have grown up within the church, Jesus comes alongside us and requires us to work with him in doing the weeding. M my experience and observation of, of sinners is that people who have never ever heard the gospel are often sanctified quickly by the Spirit of God, but those of us who are in the church, Jesus comes along and says, no, Grandma told you not to do that, and you're going to have to pull that one up with me, and I'm going to help. Both are empowered by the Spirit of God through grace. So what God offers us is the first taste of heaven which is essentially to experience the love of God. And the nature and joy that God offers us is an ever-experiencing experience of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And these things are simply the outcome of the love of God. And, and folks, let me read that list again. How many of you would like this to be your normal? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the normal that we're supposed to be, be aiming at. My friends, shouldn't we be living and believing and working for such a world with God? A world in which sin and death are unnatural. Allow me to close with the words of Isaiah 25, 7 through 9 about the day when God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the Lord will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all people, the veil that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord is, has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God, we have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord, we have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. There will be a day when tears are not normal. There will be a day when the desire for sin is unnatural. There, there will be a day when pain is something we heard about like 2,000 years ago. Oh yeah, that pain thing, we used to do that. There, there will be a day when death will be forgotten. And on that day, we will say, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for having sent the Son to save us. We pray, God, that we would be a people who do your will on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, we pray that every person here will look upon you and be saved. We pray these things in Jesus' name.